So I'm going to talk um, about the intersections between uh, concrete poetry, visual poetry, and uh, the field of conceptualism and conceptual art. Um, as perhaps being an interdisciplinary uh, transaction of some sort. And I'm going to uh, consider in that process the relationship between uh, dematerialization and the idea of the concrete. <coughs> in the US, Lucy R. Lippard and John Chandler enthusiastically announced in their text on the dematerialization of art, which appeared in 1968, that, quote, the shift of emphasis from art as product to art as idea has freed the artist from present limitations, both economic and technical. Looking back on the period uh, around 1968, in a later essay, Escape Attempts, uh, written in 1995, Lippard reminisced, unfettered by object status, conceptual artists were free to let their imaginations run rampant. She reflected, in the decommodified idea art, some of us, or was it just me, thought we had in our hands the weapon that would transform the art world into a democratic institution. But clearly, she said, whatever minor revolutions in communication have been achieved by the process of dematerializing the object, art and artists in capitalist society remain luxuries. She therefore concluded that, quote, the escape was temporary. Art was recaptured and sent back it to its white cell, although she said parole always is a possibility. Although she described the era of conceptual art as a real free-for-all, therefore, she concluded that while the democratic implications of that, uh, she concluded that the democratic implications of that phrase, although fully appropriate, were never realized. It's this uh, question of the uh, democratic implications of conceptualism that concerns me. For it seems paradoxically that while Lippard's observation that these were never realized may have been true uh, in the democratic, in inverted commas, North American context, one might argue that they were realized at least prior to the arrival of the market in the 1980s in the so-called undemocratic communist East. The newfound possibilities for artists that abandoning the object of art uh, provided had particular implications for artists in countries under communist rule. Perceived failures on one side of the Iron Curtain could be interpreted as successes on the other. Throughout the 1960s, and with increased frequency in the 1970s, photographs, projects of installations and performances, artist statements, assembly magazines, and all manner of things trickled across the border of the Soviet satellite countries through an expanding informal postal network. People knew people who knew people. They followed each other's work and they sent one another documentation of what they were doing. It became habitual to send an artist one was interested in information about one's activities and to request the same in response. And here I'm showing you um, some visual poetry by uh, the Brno uh, artist and poet, uh, Yuzhi Valoch. Hungarian networker Geza Pernetsky recalls that artists, quote, found it increasingly easy to mail to each other and to their colleagues in the West, not only photocopies, but also original works of art. Uh, Lajlo Beke was an early participant in these networks and was instrumental in establishing international links among artists across the Eastern Bloc in the 1970s as is evident from his conceptual propositions of that time. Among these, a world-famous world archive of ideas, concepts, projects, etc., of 1972. He too has argued that the Eastern European variant of conceptual art was, quote, always ready to become a social activity of a group of young people, or even an alternative movement uh, conceptual art was a group orientation, he says, most likely an expression of utopian notions of social organization. <clears throat> 
here are some visual poems by uh, Yuji Kolaj. The one on the right um, is uh, dedicated to Konstantin Brancouge. Lepard and Chandler's 1968 text uses the term concrete in a rather problematic way. They write, it may be that works of art which cannot be realized now because of lack of means uh, will at some future date be made concrete. Later they say that uh, the artist, uh, for the artist as thinker, uh, subjected to none of the limitations of the artist as maker, uh, that artist can uh, project a visionary and utopian art, which is no less art than concrete works. They argued that, quote, the newer work offers a kind of curious utopianism, which should not be confused with nihilism, except that, like all utopias, it has no concrete expression. Such statements are interesting insofar as they entirely overlook earlier uses of the term concrete, notably the use of the term concrete by concrete poets. For concrete poets, uh, language was itself a material. Quote, concrete poetry developed a new consciousness of the material of language, a new literality through linguistically influenced language analyses, and the respective definition of the pictoriality of the letter and text in relation to surface and space uh, with the means of reduction and construction. What Lepard meant by dematerialized art was that all over the place in style, that it was all over the place in style and content, but materially quite specific, by which she and Chandler meant work in which the idea is paramount and the material form is secondary, lightweight, ephemeral, cheap, unpretentious, and or dematerialized. But it's quite clear today that this definition of dematerialization entirely overlooked the specific materiality to which the authors were implicitly referring which took uh, two forms, photography on the one hand and working with language on paper on the other. It is uh, the latter that I want to look at here. I'm interested in the intersections between concrete poetry and conceptualism, as well as their potential political implications in different contexts. If North American conceptual artists, quote, gloried in speeding past the cumbersome established process of museum-sponsored exhibitions and catalogues by means of mail art, rapidly edited and published books on, and self-published books uh, of art and other smaller is better strategies, as Lepard wrote, then smaller was also better, although for different reasons, in Eastern Europe as Brno conceptualist and poet J.H. Kochman uh, demonstrated in uh, his tiny, minimal book, which is enormous there, but it should be tiny, uh, which I found in archives all over Eastern Europe and beyond, and uh, which he disseminated uh, worldwide by, through the post in uh, 1974. So this, um, the thing above is, uh, this is a bad photocopy, but the thing above is a tiny little snippet of a book, like literally a slice through a book, as though you were slicing a piece of bread, uh, which is then put into an envelope. Um, Kotsman, who was by profession a veterinary surgeon, uh, was also a self-taught poet. He wrote uh, in the early 1970s to the Polish conceptualist Jarosław Kozłowski, uh, as just in 1972, just as Czechoslovak normalization was reaching its apogee, that he sensed a general feeling that communication between us all is very important now. Experimental poetry has many sources, and I don't want to rehearse its history here, here are some more uh, works by Kochman. Uh, though I would like to note that Europeans and Latin Americans came to a shared understanding of concrete poetry when the Swiss Eugen Gomringer came into contact with the Sao Paulo Noagandres group. Gomringer uh, had hitherto been producing poems uh, under the label Constellations, which he outlined in his 1954 manifesto from verse to constellation uh, and defined as a group of words like a certain number of stars. 
Uh, but after he met with Dezio Pignatari, a member of the Noagandres group at the Ulm School of Design in 1955, uh, they agreed to refer to their parallel experiments as concrete in view of the aesthetic affinity and intellectual indebtedness uh, to the theorists, painters, and uh, sculptors of concrete art. The Noagandres, and here I'm showing you uh, two works by the uh, uh, brothers Geraldo and uh, Augusto de, de Campos, um, both from uh, 1958. The Noagandres took as their point of departure for concrete poetry Quote, being aware of graphic space as a structural agent. Gomriga summarizes their approach as stating that concrete poetry equals total responsibility towards language. Both Gomriga and the Nuagandras were influenced by Max Bill. Gomriga knew him well and was even his secretary for a time. Uh, Bill had taught at the Bauhaus. Uh, while the Brazilian poets encountered him when he produced a sensation at the Sao Paulo uh, Biennial. Bill, for his part, had adopted his idea of concrete art from Theo van Duisburg. Like international constructivism uh, and the concrete art that emerged as a branch of this, concrete poetry was also international in spirit from its inception. And here are some early works um, from uh, 54 by Gomriga. Other artists across Europe, notably in Vienna, were also arriving at similar conclusions uh, by different routes. A concrete poem should be as legible as a road sign, Gomriga argued. His commitment to simplicity was also to do with a commitment to truth. He reportedly said, a word cannot lie, whereas when you put them put together two or three, a certain deceit sets in. His poems were in some cases published in four languages, a fact that Geza Perneczki interprets as, quote, emphasizing that the poems were universal and independent of space, time, and perhaps even of man. It's worth noting that Gomriga's collection of poems called uh, the, hour, the Book of Hours and Constellations, um, and uh, this is the book in which these poems that I'm showing you now uh, appeared, was published in 1954 by the Something Else Press uh, in a series uh, edited by uh, Dick Higgins. Higgins had pioneered the use of the term, or, or did in the future, pioneer the use of the term intermedia which captures many aspects of our own interest in this, uh, over the course of this conference in interdisciplinarity. Higgins noted in his 1966 uh, statement on intermedia that our real enemies are the ones who send us to die in pointless wars or to live lives which are reduced to drudgery, not the people who use other means of communication from those which we find most appropriate to the present situation. He went on to observe that for the last 10 years or so, artists have changed their media to suit this situation, to the point where uh, the media have broken down in their traditional forms and have become merely puristic points of reference. The idea has arisen, as if by spontaneous combustion throughout the entire world, that these points are arbitrary and only useful as critical tools in saying that such and such a work is basically musical, but also poetry. This is the intermedial approach to emphasize the dialectic between the media. What interests me about this uh, statement is that he clearly saw in intermediality as a political statement of sorts, a matter of artistic solidarity in opposition to the political status quo. While he was, he was especially concerned with the Vietnam War and with the crisis in the labor movements in the US, the same strategy in the hands of his European colleagues uh, was also a response to concerns closer to home. So my definition of conceptualism is a politicized one, and my reading of concrete poetry and experimental poetry is also invested in its political dimensions. Uh, I should, of course, add um, and um, unfortunately I've left my list with all the dates um, over there, but uh, th these are two works, a manifesto and um, a poem which you see um, uh, on the left there called Freedom, which takes you through the various permutations of the words Svoboda to freedom and back, depending on which you read it. 
um, by Grogorova and Hirschal um, to Czech uh, poets. Um, from the late 1950s or early 1960s, I think. I should, of course, add that one might equally offer a tautological reading of the emergence of uh, both conceptualism and concrete poetry in the 1950s, which might run something uh, like uh, this, the description of a paradigm shift um, outlined by uh, Klaus uh, Peter Denker, for instance, uh, this is what he writes, the transition from the image in poetry to the image of poetry, and finally to poetry about poetry, a trajectory that we might liken to Joseph Kossuth's account of conceptual art. Such a trend is obviously present, and there is a great deal of art about art and poetry about poetry. But such definitions overlook the wider social and political field that produced a situation in which artists and poets were concerned to break down and reformulate their practice. Arguably, the ethical imperative to do this was itself politically motivated. Um, and so here, uh, I'd just like to quickly run through a series of works that I've selected um, by uh, Havel, who, uh, as well as being a playwright and later a politician, uh, wrote concrete poets, poems or visual poems um, in the 1960s. And there's a series of works which were published under the title Antikode, um, the first of which uh, were published in 1964, and uh, then the second volume of which appeared in 1968. And so here we see this uh, parallel interest, I think, in uh, the materiality of language, uh, trying to uh, make language uh, uh, be literal, be uh, concrete, uh, but at the same time with these uh, political elements that come in. So on the left-hand side, you have a demonstration of uh, the word and one word in isolation. And on the right, you have this really wonderful pyramidal dissection of the cult of personality personality, which obviously had clear political uh, resonances um, in the uh, 1960s as um, the Prague Spring attempted to uh, reinvent socialism with a human face. Um, this one is a, a, a also included and it's uh, an, uh, called Alienation. And so you have uh, J-A, Ya, Me. And uh, it's this, uh, he takes us on a wonderfully long and convoluted journey from the beginning to the end of the self, as though uh, we're following him, trying to understand himself. There's obviously a kind of an interesting cybernetic uh, connection here, and, and in the 60s and, and late 50s, many poets were interested in cybernetics. Um, this one uh, I, I love on the left, Kulturni Żywot. So a kind of, uh, you'd probably translate this in English as a, a kind of a decent life. And it's deeply ironic. Um, it tells you what he does on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, all the days of the week. And, and what would his kind of ideal life be like? It would consist of resting, uh, going to the cinema, watching television, sleeping. Um, Knowing Havel, I'm quite sure these were not his main activities. And on the uh, right-hand side, we have constructive satire. Um, he, as you know, was deeply concerned with uh, this question of truth and the truth of the word and living in truth, and also with uh, humanity. It's a kind of a socialist humanism that he's espousing. And uh, so this poem on the left-hand side has a whole array of numbers. It could almost be a conceptualist painting by Roman Opalka, but in the middle, floating here in white isolation, we have uh, Člověk, the, uh, the human person. Um, and, um, and on the right, keeping with this kind of human theme, uh, we have the names of uh, his friends, um, who, uh, I, I don't actually speak Czech, but I'm guessing that this is the name of a cafe where they used to meet. Um, and uh, with a collage, Yuzhi Collage, the slightly older generation poet there in the middle, and these younger artists and poets grouped around him. Here on the left, two uh, concepts of normalization. So from truth, 
uh, vanishing until there's almost nothing, or from truth cyclically returning to truth, reinventing truth. Um, on the right, you have a whole series of uh, words, uh, political words, humanism, democracy, freedom, uh, the nation, and the word which is repeated constantly, jednota, is unity. And this is a, a kind of a constellation, a poem which I think tries to capture a, the completely international spirit of 1968, which he calls the generation of the 21st of August. And you have everybody from Kennedy to Love and Karel Chichar and Ringo Starr and LSD and hippies and Truth and John Lennon. And uh, you can find your own way around this uh, visual poem. Um, I just. That's explicitly political, but I think it's a shared concern with other poets. And I'd just like to quickly show another uh, kind of a Samizdat publication of this period by the Polish artist Stanisław Druszcz, um, uh, who, in the, as of the 1960s, was producing what he called uh, concepto forms, or concepti forms, pojęcia uh, kształty. And uh, th these were published in, uh, as a book in Wrocław in 1970, and there was a strong con uh, concrete um, poetry movement in Wrocław. And just on the first uh, two pages, you have the first page just has the repeated word why, 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 why. Uh, the second page says people, people, people. Um, the, the one on the left is very famous and has had various other versions, and it's the word which says forgetting. And it illustrates very simply uh, a word, the word forgetting being forgotten. On the right-hand side, you have this uh, existential uh, concern and, uh, with uh, life and death and their intertwinement. So I think you can see that Havel and uh, Drusht are, are working along uh, similar lines in this uh, period that they're very much part of a common spirit and, and generation. Echoing uh, Gomriga's uh, claims about the truth of a word as opposed to the deceit of a sentence, Borowski has argued that Drusht and other concretists strove to make themselves trust the language, not to distrust it. Drusch called them uh, substantial forms, these poems, self-analyzing reality codifiers, integrating science and art, poetry, and the fine arts. Adam Shimchuk has also noted that the concepti forms uh, were to be a step towards the internationalization of language. Their concreteness uh, should nullify the problem of uh, translation, or at least this was the aim. When the Polish artists Jarosław Kozłowski and Andrzej Kostołowski mailed out their well-known conceptual statement NET in 1972, uh, announcing a new international system for the circulation of artistic propositions to over 350 participants uh, worldwide, they received a great volume of responses. Many of these uh, took the form of concrete and visual poetry. The project yielded both a theoretically robust conception of the alternative network and a vast archive of materials received from those they invited to participate and in their contacts in turn. One of the themes that we find repeatedly in the NET archive is international communication itself. Artists producing work for international distribution were often concerned to explore the conditions of international production, distribution, and reception. Uh, Bogdanka Poznanovich's announcement of communication in continuo of 1976 contains the word breath, uh, translated into nine languages and arranged to form a hexagon at the center of the page, drifting uh, between conceptualism and concrete poetry. Jun uh, Mizukami's Pan Rights Report, 95 of the same year, uh, proposes a conceptualist game of Chinese whispers by changing the second C in communication for all the possible letters of the alphabet to produce a finite series of permutations. Hungarian mail artist Geza Perneczki's series of white stamps on postcards is stamped with the word secret in different languages, suggesting the idea of a secret traveling the globe on postcards. The same sense of community beyond borders was condensed in a simple statement by Brazilian artist Angelo de Aquino. 
work in progress too, in which he wrote to say, all country is my country, all name is my name, all work is my work, not so modestly. I'm you and I'm me, uh, signed and uh, dated. Japanese fluxus artist Mieko Shiomi's 1974 spatial poems offer another remarkable mechanism for connecting people and their activities around the world. Open event, spatial poem number five, encouraged invitees to do whatever they liked within a set performance period and to send a 300-word report on the activity to Shiomi in Osaka. Sound event, uh, spatial poem number seven, was designed to produce a global symphony and lists times across time zones in countries around the world, requesting that at their designated time people listen to the sounds around them and send back a report describing these to Xiaomi. In exchange, she undertook to plot these activities on world maps. These also became uh, documents of international creative cooperation. Uh, the archive also has a number of pieces uh, by the French poet uh, Henri Chopin, uh, who published the important uh, international poetry Revue U, between uh, 1964 and 74. He was one of the artists with whom Kozłowski remained in touch over the course of many years and exhibited at his uh, pop-up exhibition space, Accumulatore uh, II, which shared a space four days a week with a student nightclub um, at the Students' Center in uh, Poznań. Um, and I'll just run through, here are some photographs from uh, the event and the invitation. Uh, Chopin was not the only uh, concrete and, uh, or visual, well, visual poet um, who was hosted by the Accumulatore uh, to gallery. Uh, Karl Friedrich Kra um, Klaus also was invited uh, from East Germany, another extraordinary uh, poet. Um, East Germany uh, hasn't been the focus of my attention, but uh, was really a great hub of uh, concrete poetry. Among others, uh, the artist couple uh, Robert and Ruth Rehfeld. Here are some later works by Ruth Rehfeld. Emmett Williams uh, was also invited to Poland at least three times. And um, here are the uh, posters advertising his, um, his visits. Um, in addition to the Accumulatore uh, II uh, space, uh, arguably the key space uh, for this kind of experimental poetry in uh, Poland was in Warsaw. Uh, Andrzej Partom's Bureau Poesie, the Poetry Bureau, or Bureau de la Poesie, uh, which opened in 1971 um, at, in his bed-sitting room in the attic of the same building as the Hotel Polonia, um, became an extraordinary international hub. Uh, the degree to which conceptual and poetry circles were intertwined in this period is evident from the many global art world visitors. Here uh, is Daniel Buren uh, visiting. Here is uh, Jorge Glusberg from um, the Centro de Arte y Comunicación in, in Buenos Aires. Um, and you've got a whole uh, list of international visitors which he has proudly um, put together here on the uh, left-hand side, which in includes some of the poets whose work I, I showed you earlier. Um, so throughout the course of the 1970s, uh, these people are visiting Warsaw uh, until uh, Parton's emigration to uh, Denmark in the early 1980s. Uh, Pernetsky notes that while their magazines and catalog prefaces suggest that they were constantly frustrated by what they uh, considered an acute lack of publicity, uh, he's talking about European poets here, except perhaps for the Italians who have been constantly publishing textual collages ever since the period of futurism, he said, it seems that the European visual poets have always enjoyed, enjoyed a functioning professional network, albeit a peripheral one. He discusses a certain shift that can be observed between the generations of concrete poets uh, in Europe. Those artists who in the 70s appeared as the represent, uh, representatives of the first, quote, unofficial uh, generation of concrete artists differed from the concrete poets, uh, so the earlier generation of the original concrete poets like Gomringer, uh, not so much in their artistic aims or in their training, but instead in that their environment um, had relegated them to the cultural and economic peripheries. As Kozłowski uh, wrote, 
uh, his network, which was to a great extent the same network, was composed of artists who were not interested in careers, commercial success, popularity, or recognition. Artists who devoted more attention to the issue of their own artistic and therefore ethical uh, stance than to their position in the rankings, whether the ranking in question was based on the highest listing on the market or the highest level of approval from the authorities. These artists professed other values and other goals led them onwards. They were focused on art, conceived as the realm of cognitive freedom and creative discourse. So there's clearly something uh, strange happening here between these claims and the uh, Pernetsky's observations about the highly uh, networked degree of this uh, professional uh, group. The parallel network uh, was a way of overcoming uh, political isolation and superseding the official identities proposed by the nation state and superpower ideologies. And yet th there was also a clear sense in which all this communication was also in itself a conceptual project. Arguably, the cultural position in the West was inevitably as much politically embroiled as it was in the East, ideologically and economically. Both sides of the Cold War lived with the same sort of paradoxes. It may now uh, be with a view to a historical equivalence uh, rather than from the position of difference that we should view the international exchanges of this period. Focusing on identifying shared languages of concern developed by artists in the uh, face of the protracted and stagnant superpower standoff, uh, acknowledging that there existed a global periphery that included many Western practitioners as well. An alternative global artists networks of small is better inspired exchange. This mode of practice was as appealing to artists in the West, where the market posed the greatest challenge to creative autonomy, as it was in the East, where this was posed by the state, and paradoxically by the absence of the market. Nevertheless, we should be cautious of advancing, we should be cautious of, an, of advancing an entirely triumphant reading of this heroic internationalism. From a Western perspective, Lippard later reflected that one of the problems was that for the most part, quote, communication was perceived as distribution. And it was in this area that populist desires were raised but unfulfilled. Unquote. Lippard notes that, quote, communication between people was subordinate to communication about communication. Communication but not community and distribution but not accessibility were inherent in conceptual art. Uh, although the forms pointed towards democratic outreach, she says that the content did not. However rebellious the escape attempts, most of the work remained art referential. Um, and neither economic nor aesthetic ties to the art world were fully severed, though at times we like to think they were hanging by a thread. Contact with a broader audience was vague and undeveloped, she concludes. It's, con it's clear that this same limitation also applies to some extent in the Soviet satellites. And, uh, and this is why, uh, with the exception of rare figures like Havel, uh, we can on, perhaps only uh, call artists dissidents if we take uh, this to mean living in truth in the international art world. Thank you.